Well, good morning, friends. Grateful to see you. Thankful for those who have been away or able to be back this morning, and we're glad for that. Thankful for our visitors as well. We are in Acts chapter 15, and the goal is to complete this chapter this morning. We got through the first half on Wednesday night, and James is going to do chapter 16 um, on Wednesday. But before we uh, begin, we're going to have a word of prayer, and Jason is going to lead us in that, if you would, please. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you for this beautiful morning, the rain that you blessed us with. We thank you for allowing us to gather here to study your word and worship and study this book of Acts. We pray, Father, that you be with all of us as Mike brings us brings us this study this morning, that we pay attention and we open up our Bibles and we read along and we follow along and we study what is being presented to us. And then, Father, we ask that you, you allow us to absorb the material and, and take it with us when we leave today and use it throughout the week at our jobs and our homes, school. We thank you for this congregation that worships here and all the work that goes on behind the scenes, the elders, for their leadership, the deacons and the hard work that they do and and for Mike and his preparing of his material for the class and the lessons week after week. We ask Father that you watch over us today and watch over us the rest of this week and keep us safe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Okay, so on Wednesday night, we started in chapter 15, and we noted how this begins on the heels of, or on the heel of, of the first missionary journey for Paul. That's how chapter 14 ends, where they went through the Galatian area, basically. And so they were at Antioch of Syria for a long period of time, and then while they were there, there were some people that came to town from Judea, especially Jerusalem, Christians who were saying that the Gentile Christians, and there, were, there was an abundance of them at Antioch, <clears throat> that they had to be physically circumcised to be right with God, to be saved. And we noted how that was a procedure that God had required of his people. It was an identifying mark of his people for centuries, going back even before the law of Moses, to Abraham where it began. And so there was this element and this belief that it was required still of those who would be known as God's people. And it's true, we are to be circumcised still, even to this day. But we noted how it's a, phys or it's a spiritual circumcision and not a physical procedure. Well, they had to resolve this. Paul and Barnabas responded immediately in Antioch to these people who were saying that, and there was a big uproar over this. And so it was decided to go to Jerusalem itself to see... Obviously, if this is being commissioned by that church, and if there is a, a section there that's still teaching this, then to correct this. But to validate, okay, did you send these men like you, they say you did? You know, were they sent out by you? Is this church teaching people to be physically circumcised to be saved? So they go there not to decide whether or not to believe and practice this. They go there to see if this is indeed being commissioned, and to respond to it, obviously, if it is, to prevent further error being broadcast from this church. So they're there, and the apostles and elders gather, and there is a dispute, even among themselves, in verse 7 about this. So apparently there is at least a, you know, a, a, a portion of people there who were thinking, okay, yeah, you, you still have to do this. 
And there were others who could see that you're not. It's not required. Well, in discussing this, Peter gets up and he basically goes through how he had taught Cornelius. And as he was teaching Cornelius, the Spirit came upon them in the same way the Spirit came upon the apostles in the beginning. And so he uses that example to show that obviously uh, he wasn't teaching Gentiles to be physically circumcised to be saved. And God had given them the Spirit to prove that they were to receive the gospel. And so this was never a part of that, is the implication that Peter's making. And so obviously he is, he's trying to, to persuade the people to see that, in verse 11, we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. That's another way of looking at that, that we can be saved the same way they, they were saved. And obviously they were... Acts 10, I mean, it shows that they weren't taught to be physically circumcised. They were taught to be immersed in water for the remission of sins. And it says in verse 12, The multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. So now you not only have Peter, but now you have Paul and Barnabas get up. And they're saying, look, we were able to perform all these miracles among the Gentiles... And again, the implication is there's no way God would have given us these abilities if we were teaching error. You know, if we had failed by not teaching them to be physically circumcised, there's no way God would have endorsed our teaching with these miracles. And then, of course, following them, James gets up and he shows that through Amos, the prophecy was that the Gentiles would be part of God's people when the tabernacle of David is rebuilt, and of course it's all pointing to the spiritual te temple, tabernacle, the church, and we understand it's talking about Christianity and how it was God's plan all along to bring in the Gentiles. It wasn't a plan B, it was plan A. He's always been working toward this. And so he's showing that obviously... God's always wanted this. This is what he was pointing towards. And so when James said that, uh, he says in verse 19, Therefore I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God. And so that's the solution. The solution is, okay, look, we, we can't do this. Okay, we cannot bind this on these people. We shouldn't require this of them to trouble them who are turning to God. And that was the solution. And they heard this. They heard Peter's answer. They heard Paul and Barnabas' answer. And now they heard James' answer. And they all agreed with it. Yeah, they were disputing at first. But now they're like, okay, you guys are right. We don't need to be doing it. This is not something that should be required of Gentiles. And so James says, look, I believe we need to write a letter to write to them in verse 20 to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual morality, from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. And it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to sin, chosen men. And so they decide, okay, look, we need to teach them to not do this, but to at least still avoid these other things. Now, we read that, that they were to avoid the polluted things, the sexual morality and things like that with blood. My question is this, why was that relevant to this issue? I mean, here they're talking about physical circumcision, trying to figure out whether or not to bind this on people. James gets up, says we can't do it, but while we're talking to them, let's mention these things as well. Why was that relevant? Those were physical things they were doing that were wrong. Okay. These are things that they were doing that were wrong? Okay. Could have been? Yeah. That historically, as a people, the Gentiles 
we're taught to do these things. Okay? So why bring that up now, though? We're talking about physical circumcision. Why include these things? Okay, all right. It's, it's, diff- it's making it more difficult for the Gentiles. Okay. What now? It's making it more difficult for the Gentiles. Oh, right, yeah, the physical circumcision. Yeah, it was definitely making, them, making it more difficult for them. Um, and, yeah, that would have been the hindrance for sure. Did you have something? Yeah, Mike, I, I honestly don't know why these things right. came other than sexual immorality. I mean, that's, that's clearly preached. Yeah. That's clearly preached, uh, in the New Testament, but the reason he gives in the following verse, verse, it says, for the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. So I think it has something to do with the Jews. Okay. Maybe the Jews being more willing to accept these Gentiles. Oh. Making sure they're doing things to not create barriers between them and the Jews. Okay. All right. Uh, because, yeah, you do have two groups of people here. I mean, a group that was doing these things and then a group that was taught from the law of Moses not to do these things. So I think that's definitely a factor here. Any other thoughts before? Oh, yes, L.R. Yeah. I think on this, uh, we're, looking at, uh, uh, we're looking at things that go back to the beginning of okay. the Bible. Uh, marriage from Genesis 2, we're looking at when... Uh, a, a, animals and not consuming their blood even way before okay. uh, Moses. Because right. uh, they're going back to circumcision, back to Abraham. Right. And he's going back even further with these issues. And adultery, you know, protecting marriage, uh, not consuming blood. Idolatry was one of the things that were happening early, uh, there even before Abraham. Mm-hmm. So we're talking about, hey, we're going to this. Let's, let's see what God said in the very beginning mm-hmm. and make sure we're still following these principles that are, are we're to keep the whole time. Right, right. That seems to be the right answer. Uh, to me, that, that makes sense. That we're talking about something that was it, was, it was something rooted, not only in the law of Moses, but predating the law of Moses. That is physical circumcision, that is. This was something that was, was going back for centuries. But I, I believe the like LR is getting at, the response includes that about adultery, or I'm sorry, idolatry, because these two were condemned in the law of Moses and even before the law of Moses. And these things, yeah, they may have been in the same timeline as circumcision, but they're still, they're still required of us. You know, here's, here's another way of looking at it. I put this together. I mean, we can, we can look at the dispensations. We understand that. Okay, we know that the Bible's dealing with three periods of time, three dispensations of how God revealed his will to people. And we look at the topic of physical circumcision, we can see that it was, yes, in the law of Moses and even before the law of Moses. But as we're seeing in Acts 15, it is not in the law of Christ. Now, in, in light of that, I believe that's why he brought up these other things that the Gentiles as a whole were taught to practice these things with idolatry. And this was part of their culture. And this was condemned not only in the law of Moses, but even before that. An example would have been the blood. That even Noah, they were taught to not consume blood because life is in the animal, or life is in the blood. And so it, it seems to me that these were things that they were struggling with that were always taught against, especially from the law of Moses. And the Jews got that. They understood that. But they didn't know this. The Gentiles didn't know this. And so they needed to know this. And so they had to be shown that these are things that, yes, they're in the same category of physical circumcision, of predating Christ through the law of Moses and even, we might say, the patriarchal age, but they're still condemned today in the law of Christ. And so he's trying to get them to realize, look, yeah, you, you still need to avoid these things. That there are things that are rooted in your culture that are a violation of God's will that you have to avoid. And 
Uh, to me, that just seems to be, uh, you know, a legitimate response with the context, okay? Anything else on that? Now, here's what my, I do want to know about this one, though, okay? Because he does talk about things polluted by idols. What would that be? Things polluted by idols. You have something that's been corrupted by idols. Well, yes, sir. Okay. But he also said it's okay to eat those things right. in certain circumstances. There you go. <laughs> okay, in certain circumstances. <laughs> under, uh, under certain circumstances, when you realize, but to also, if it was to be a problem with somebody okay. who was raised right. in this uh, culture of idolatry, okay. and idol worship, to, to completely abstain from it, mm -hmm. you know, so that you would not risk harming the soul of your brother. Okay. But it wasn't, you know, it was, it was stipulated. Okay. To, yeah, conditional. I see what you're saying. Yeah, that's true. I mean, yeah, the, the things that were polluted by idols would have been definitely like the animals. You know, you have something that's whole and innocent, you know, wholesome, innocent. And they've taken it and offered it to these false gods. And so that would have been corrupt in that sense. Especially in the ceremony itself. Where these animals are sacrificed to these false gods. And as Matt was getting at. I mean you can see in 1 Corinthians 8 and 1 Corinthians 10. That there were some regulations about eating things that had been sacrificed to idols. Conscience was a big factor. You could buy it in the marketplace. But... He goes on to say, you cannot go and offer this stuff, right? You cannot go to the actual temples and engage in that worship. That would be idolatry. Or if you're with somebody and it becomes an issue for them for you to eat meat sacrificed to idols, then don't eat meat. You know, that's what we see in those chapters. But the Gentiles had to be taught, look, you've got to avoid these things that have been polluted by idols. You've got to avoid fornication or sexual morality. Now, how was that tied in with idolatry? Do you know? How was fornication associated with idolatry for these people? Yes, sir. Well, the, uh, the Corinthians were uh, the pagan temple were having uh, priestesses or women that would have uh, ritual fornication, and other other pagan uh, pagan religions did that too. But they had ritual fornication, and uh, one thing that Paul warned them about is don't get caught up in that because you're polluting your body. Sexual sins against your body. Okay. And so that's one of the problems there. Okay, right. So they would literally worship these gods with these sexual acts. And so you would have the harlots and you would have the temple prostitutes. And people were taught, okay, you want to honor this god, then you, you perform this act. You're... you're Becoming one with this God when you become one with this person is the belief. And they were taught this. They were taught that this is how you honor these gods. With these sacrifices, with this behavior, with the drinking of blood. That was part of it. That they, that this was part of that worship service of consuming raw blood. And things strangled, that is, things that have not been properly drained, they were taught to consume these things. It's disturbing for us because we've been taught to avoid these things. And it's not part of our culture. But these people were encouraged to engage in these things. And they had to be shown, okay, look, yeah, we're not going to bind this physical circumcision on you, which has been condemned or bound for centuries. Okay, no, we're not going to do that. But you, you have got to come around and avoid these things that have always been condemned by God. That you've been practicing and you've got to come out of that and be separate from that. And so they use it as an opportunity to correct their thinking, the people's thinking in regard to these things. Obviously going back to culture. And so it was, it was a good moment to remind them of their need to avoid idolatry. Okay? Anything else on that before we move on? 
Okay. All right. Well, uh, it says that they decided to send this letter with some highly respected people from the church. In verse 22, it pleased the, whole, the apostles, the elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Barnabas and Paul, namely Judas, who was also named Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. So we're going to send back this letter, but we're going to send it back with some people who have some great reputations at this church. Now my question is, how would that have helped matters? How would it have helped matters to send back this letter, but then to send men like this from the church? Credibility. All right, credibility. All right to reinforce that this is not something this church is teaching. This is not something this church endorses. The people who did this, they acted on their own. Okay? And yeah, so these men of good reputation would have validated that even more. Okay? You know, going the extra mile is kind of the thought here. Yes, brother. Right. Okay, in case somebody else came from Jerusalem, you said? Yeah. To, to, to say this again, yeah, that these men could, could refute that because they were very much a part of the work there. But, you know, it says uh, Barsabbas, I don't know of much more that's said about him in the Bible, but we know a whole lot or a little bit more about this second guy, Silas. Because Silas was one of those men chosen from Jerusalem, to go deliver this letter. And we know that eventually he would be very involved in the work of the New Testament because he was uh, mentioned in the first and second Thessalonian letter, the very first verse of both letters uh, by the name Silvanus. And then we see at the end of chapter 15, as we'll see, he was Paul's companion on the second missionary journey for Paul, which goes back through you know, the Galatian area. Um, so he was, he was with Paul, and they eventually went up to Macedonia, and you know that great scene of where Paul and Silas are in prison at Philippi, and they're singing and praying to God at midnight. That's the guy. You know, that's the guy that's with Paul. The guy that left Jerusalem to go validate this letter, who ended up staying there at Antioch, and eventually became very vital in the work of of Christ with Paul, okay? All right, so you see that's where he enters the New Testament story. So they write this letter. They decide to write this letter. And you see what's stated in the letter. Uh, it says in verse 23, they wrote this letter by them, the apostles, the elders, and the brethren, to the brethren who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Now, keep in mind, Antioch is like a capital, okay, of Syria. So it's a very significant city. Many Gentile converts there. And so to address them was, you know, again, to address a place, address a place of, of influence. And so he includes Cilicia here, or they do. Greetings. In verse 24, since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words unsettling your soul, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good to us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will also report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, from sexual morality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. And so they took this letter. And how did they respond when they heard this letter? How dare they tell us how to live? I mean, here we are as Gentiles. They're Jewish Christians. Who do they think they are telling us how to live? How did they respond? 
they rejoiced. It says in verse 30, they went out, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter. When they had read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. Now, what could possibly be encouraging about a letter that says, stop drinking blood and having sexual morality? All right, clarity. All right, what do you mean by that? Uh, in an uncertain world, clarity is, is, provides comfort. That's true. That soundness, that right judgment, can, that clarity, as he's, Greg's mentioning, it, it does provide relief and peace, certainly. But they're being told to avoid all these things, and they're rejoicing over it. Go ahead. Okay. You know, these people could have dissented and went this odd route this. We believe that will split our ways and go that way. And that had been immaturity. But instead, we, we see people looking for the truth. Mm -hmm. Which, When you look for the truth, that's a, a level of maturity. And we're seeing that here, which is a great example for us to live by. Okay, good, right. Yeah, that good heart, that maturity, to be spiritually minded, to receive the truth, rejoice in the truth. Absolutely. That's inherent. I mean, that's just part of godly living is that we are one with God when we let his word abide in us. Certainly, that's the truth. But, you know, to know that, okay, well, all right then. These guys weren't telling these other people to go out and teach this doctrine. Okay then. Well, that's good. That the church did not commission these men. And instead they've commissioned the message of not binding physical circumcision on Gentiles. That's a reason to rejoice. But so is this other, you know, conf this other distinction that's given. That, yeah, now they know and now they've been reassured, okay, yeah, there are things we do have to give up and things we do need to separate ourselves from as a culture. And that, that direction, that insight was something that certainly would have brought encouragement to them. Listen, if, as was already stated, you know, if, we, if we truly love God, we're going to love his word no matter what it says. Even when it may condemn things we have been taught to do as a people. That when we love God the way we should, we're going to submit to him and receive the truth because of our desire to please him. And it doesn't matter what it is. And if these people as a culture can be taught to avoid things like this and rejoice over that, then what about our culture? Things that we're taught as a society that completely contradict God's will, will we rejoice in the truth? Will we uphold the truth? Will we abide in the truth when it conflicts with what our family has taught or practiced or people we know have practiced for generations. Something to think about. Anything else on that point? Now that letter did not stop at Antioch. Uh, they eventually took this letter and used it in other places. As it goes on to say in chapter 16 and in verse 4, they were able to, to share that with other people went through other cities and they delivered to them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem. So just in case these knuckleheads who got to Antioch with this message of circumcision, just in case their influence was spreading further, you know, the apostles, or at least Paul, they, they take this and they say, look, this is not what that church was teaching, just in case you had heard it was. Now, there's something here in this statement that's, that's totally relevant, especially to us today. Where he says in verse 24, We've heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such command. To whom we gave no such commandment. You ever heard people say, Well, the Bible doesn't say not to. You ever heard that? That when you're dealing with some doctrinal matter, whether it be that of salvation or worship or the church or the work of the church or morality or marriage, well, the Bible doesn't say not to. 
What's wrong with that reasoning? The Bible doesn't say not to. All right, it doesn't say to do it either, right? And that's what we have to understand. Um, whatever we're dealing with, I mean, if that's going to be the answer, our first response has to be what? You're dealing with somebody and you have some doctrinal issue. Um, let's just take uh, Easter. You know, where people once a year are going to celebrate the resurrection of Christ and they're going to have a, a communion service just for that and designate that day as the day to celebrate his resurrection. The Bible doesn't say not to. Or the birth of Christ. We might even go there with Christmas. The Bible doesn't say not to celebrate the birth of Christ. It doesn't say not to have this special ceremony for baby Jesus. It doesn't say not to. How do you respond to that? All right, you need book, chapter, and verse. That's exactly right. Now, why would you say that, though? Because if it's truly from God, and we act on his authority only, not man's. Okay. All right. Very good. All right, so if it's truly from God, he would have authorized it, is what Greg is saying, and that's exactly right. That we have to have where he has told us to do certain things. You know, where has he told us to celebrate December 25th or any day as the birth of Christ? Where has he told us to have an annual ceremony for the resurrection of Christ on a day that we designate? I mean, where has he directed people to do this? That has to be the answer. That is, where has he told us to do that? And all you have to do is come back to Acts 15. Because these Jewish Christians could have said, well, you didn't say not to. God didn't say not to not be physically circumcised. <laughs> he didn't say not to. But their answer is like, uh, we never told you to do this. God's never told you to do this. You went rogue on this one. You acted on your own authority. You did not have authority from God. And that's the answer, friends. Anytime we're up against any dilemma... We have to look for what God has said about that. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11, that's exactly what Peter's saying. That if anyone speaks, talking about, of course, in teaching. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. That in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. We have to have his authority. And so I can't say, well, he didn't tell me not to tell people to be physically circumcised. That, that wouldn't have worked, and it won't work today. So we have to go by what God has said. And when he specifies something, we cannot become generic about it. Okay? When he tells us to do certain things, like taking the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, he has shown us through his word, this is what he wants his people to do to remember the sacrifice of Christ every first day of the week, that he has specified that, and he's shown us that. And so we cannot go beyond that in defining what we want regarding um, special services for Christ and memorializing him. Or if there's some type of generic authority, then we have to have that as well, at least that, for whatever we're doing. But we have to have positive authority from God to do something. Go ahead, brother. Wow. Doesn't mean it's going to please God. And when the day of judgment comes, he'll say, Depart from me, I never knew. Man, okay, there you go. That's a good reference. Just because something may seem right, this is what Jesus himself said, and that's exactly right. Where Jesus says, Matthew 7, 21 through 23, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So it is a matter of obedience, right? It is a matter of walking by faith in his word. And it's always been about that. I mean, Cain could have pulled this card out from day one. You know, when, it got, when they got down to offering worship to God at that time, 
Abel decided to walk by faith in God's revealed will at that time. Cain decided for whatever reason he was going to venture away from that. His response could have easily been, well, God, you didn't say not to. You didn't say not to do these things. But see, when God told them what to sacrifice, that automatically excluded any other type of sacrifice. Go ahead, brother. Okay, yeah. And Nathan came back and said, go. And then God sent him back. And God's first statement to him wasn't, you're a man of blood. That comes up later. His first statement is, I didn't tell you to do this. Hmm. Go back to 2 Samuel 7. That's the first thing he said, did I ask you to do this? Mm -hmm. But the implication being the answer is no. So he didn't tell him to do it. That's all he needed to say. I didn't tell you to do this. Okay, all right. Um, all right, so to have that commission from God then is what was needed. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, even the Hebrew writer gets into this. You know, when he's talking about it's obvious that there's been a change of law because Jesus is our high priest. And what argument does he use in light of that? That it's evident we're under a new law with Jesus as our high priest. What, what argument does he use? Because Jesus came from the tribe of... Judah, right? And the priesthood came from, the law of Moses came, it came through the Levi. And so, obviously, if Jesus is high priest, we're under a different law because you could not have a priest of the Jewish tribe, or a tribe of Judah, serving as a priest under the old law. Go ahead, brother. Okay, we're supposed to do what Christ says through God. Right. Here's the way I look at it, is what would Christ do? Okay. If Christ would do this, then why not do it? No questions asked. Because if you think about it, if Christ tells us in this special letter, book, that he does things. He didn't have to do that. Mm -hmm. He didn't have to die on the cross. Mm -hmm. But it's what Christ did for everybody. And as long as I have that in my mind, then I'm going to think that way. I have to. Right. Yeah, to let him be glorified and not ourselves. Anything that he wants is what we're going to do. Go ahead, brother. Well, he's coming, so. I, I think we have to be real careful on what we're saying here because if I choose for my son when he was born to be circumcised, oh, okay. I have that privilege right. and that right, right to do it under what I thought, not in serving God. That's the same thing else. If I want to study with my family on the partaking of the Lord's Supper mm -hmm. and, and that and what we do in worship, I can do that any day of the week with my family. But when we're talking about what we do to worship to God, mm -hmm. then it falls under what we're talking about in studying. But there are some things that falls underneath an individual Christian can do that they cannot do in worship. Right, yeah, that's true. That's a category too, that there is a personal liberty on things that the church as a whole may not be allowed to do. And you can see that in 1 Timothy five, sixteen, even, with um, the helping of, of needy widows, or widows with uh, godly children. Now, that's, a very, that's another good point, though. Yeah, we're not talking about the actual procedure of circumcision in general, okay? I mean, yes, it is, there is a liberty. And in fact, there were people who, Timothy, right, was he not circumcised to have more influence among the Jewish people? So yeah, you could do it as a personal liberty. Paul acknowledged that, but at no point were people required to do this to be saved. Even Titus was not compelled to be circumcised, is what he said in Galatians. So that's true. I mean, it's We've got to distinguish between personal liberty and doctrine or salvation 
And so, yeah, you cannot be physically circumcised to be saved. It's just not God's will. He hasn't revealed that. But as we see here, he's specifically condemned it. All right, so we have to have authority from God. Let's, I mean, the elders are going to say, okay, well, from now on, we're going to start worshiping on the third Thursday of every month, and that's going to be the, the day we gather to take the Lord's Supper every month. Well, that may be a decision, but where has God authorized it? You see, where has God declared that to be His will? And so we have to go by what He has said. And you can even see in this context that you have men who are appealing to approved example. You have men who are appealing to necessary inference to meet these conclusions. Look, obviously God's endorsed what I've said, Peter said, because the, the, the Spirit came upon Cornelius, and he wasn't physically circumcised, and we didn't teach him that to be saved. Obviously God approved of that. Paul and Barnabas, obviously God approved of this teaching because of the... Spirit. So they're, they're appealing to example or inference, or even James might say went back to the command for the Gentiles to be part of God's people. And that, you know, sometimes people say, well, that's just ter Church of Christ terminology. That, that's not, this is how we communicate. We use this stuff everyday life, in everyday life. You go to a store and you see on the door before you walk in, you must wear a mask at all times. What does that mean? You're, you're about to go through the store. It's on the door. You must wear a mask at all times. you got to wear a mask, right? And so we would conclude, okay, that means that I have to wear a mask when I'm in the store. But no one would say, okay, well, that means... I have to always wear one at home, in the car, in the shower. I can never not wear a mask is what that command means. Well, no, in the context, it necessarily implies when you're in this store, you're going to wear this thing. We understand that. You see, that, that's just part of our communication as a people. And so let us not get lost in thinking, well, that, that's just some church terminology or doctrine. No, we see it being used here even in Acts chapter 15. Now I do need to wrap this up. I've got like three minutes because Acts 15 doesn't end with this letter. What we see is that the people were rejoicing but then it says uh, that it seemed good to Silas to remain there. Okay, This uh, caravan went back um, that had come to Antioch from Jerusalem, but it seemed good to Silas to remain there, and Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. So they're hanging out here at the church of Antioch in Syria, which again, like I said in the last class, I can't believe there's no letter to the church at Antioch in the New Testament. It's, it was a significant church. It's where Paul began his first missionary journey. It's where he's about to begin his second one, as we'll see at the end. But it says after some days, that's what Paul was saying. In verse uh, 36, he said to Barnabas, let's go back. You know, let's go back to this area. Um, I don't know, is that a pointer? Okay, I guess it is, yeah. But right in there, you know, let's go back in this area and see these people again that we, we taught on, like I said, what we consider the first missionary journey. And it says here that... Barnabas agreed to that, but he wanted to bring his nephew, John Mark, in verse 37. And so Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. And we know that uh, from the first journey, he decided to leave in the middle of that trip. Uh, no reason is given, but he did leave them after they left uh, Cyprus, I believe. And so they got to Pamphylia and, and Mark uh, took off. Well, they're going back again, and Barnabas says, let's, uh, let's bring my nephew. And I think that is his nephew, Colossians 4 and verse 10, or possibly even his cousin. But they are relatives. In verse 38, Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. Man, okay. Well, anyway, they split up, and then we see that Paul... And Silas go on 
what is the next missionary journey, okay? Maybe we'll have a sermon on that with Paul and Barnabas' contention. We'll talk about that sometime. But that'll be the end of uh, chapter 15, and on Wednesday we'll do chapter 16. Thank you.